So good afternoon, everyone. A very warm welcome to our next Science Setu lecture, which is organized by RCB to commemorate India's 75 years of independence. So it's my absolute pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Deepti Jain. So Dr. Deepti completed her PhD from the National Institute of Immunology in New Delhi, after which she moved to the Rockefeller University for her postdoc. Following that, she returned to India and joined as a visiting fellow at the National Center for Biological Sciences in Bangalore. And then she moved to RCB and currently she's an associate professor here. So her group works on the molecular mechanisms of transcriptional regulation very broadly. And she uses a combination of structural, biophysical, biochemical, and uh, in vivo functional tools to understand this mechanism. So she has several um, awards to her name, including the Distinguished Alumnus Award, which was given by Gargi College, University of Delhi, Serb Early Career Award given by DST, the Innovative Young Biotechnologist Award also by DBT, and a number of postdoctoral fellowships um, for her um, postdoc tenure at uh, US. And her work has been published in a number of prestigious uh, journals, such as Science Advances, Structure, Journal of Molecular Biology, ACS Chemical Biology, and Molecular Cell, to just name a few. Today, she will share with us her work on transcriptional regulation of flagellar and biofilm genes in the bacterial pathogen Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And with that, I would like to now request her to begin her lecture. Thank you, Divya, for the introduction. Um, so uh, research in our laboratory is focused on understanding the structural details of transcription factors and their complexes uh, that regulate gene expression in pathogenic bacteria. And we have used Pseudomonas aeruginosa as our model system in the past. And we are particularly focused on understanding how uh, genes of flagellar and biofilm genes in Pseudomonas are regulated. So Pseudomonas uh, is a, a gram-negative pathogen It's an open pathogen, which is primary cause of nosocomial infection. So it's a primary cause of hospital acquired infections, and it causes uh, morbidity and mortality among patients who have immunocompromised immune system. That is, uh, those who are suffering from cystic fibrosis, or if there's a burn or wound infection. And this uh, happens because it has a remarkable ability to form biofilms. Biofilms are surface attached communities of pseudomonas, which becomes en encapsulated in a polysaccharide matrix. And because of this thick matrix, which surrounds the pathogen, they become impermeable to antimicrobials. And this makes the bacteria thousand times resistant to antibiotics. And therefore, it has been placed as a critical pathogen in the WHO priority list of antimicrobial resistant bacteria. And there are no drugs currently available to treat these biofilms. Surgical removal is one of the methodology to, for treatment. And these biofilms can form on both abiotic as well as biotic surfaces. So it can form in lungs of patients who are suffering from cystic fibrosis. And it can also form on catheters, or pacemakers or contact lenses that are uh, abiotic surfaces. Um, uh, and it's a big uh, um, problem in uh, healthcare. So this is the electron micrograph of Pseudomonas wild type bacteria, which is a rod shaped gram negative bacteria, polar flagella. Now this flagella is important for biofilm formation and it exists in do lifestyle, which means it can exist as a free floating bacteria. And it can also exist in the biofilm mode of life as we just discussed. So the biofilms are initiated when this flagellated bacteria first senses the surface. So this surface sensing happens through flagella. And this is followed by attachment to these surfaces. So flagella plays an important role as a mechanosensory organ. And we have shown in our laboratory that if you have a flagellate variants of this organism, there's defect in biofilm formation. So this flagella is important for adhesion. It is also part of the matrix component. And it is also important for next stage 
which is micro colony and macro colony formation. So these, this is the next stage of biofilms. And as you can see here, bacteria becomes a flagellate, which means flagellar genes are down-regulated. And this becomes encapsulated in this matrix, which is made up of exopolysaccharide. So all these exopolysaccharide matrix genes become upregulated when the bacteria transitions from planktonic flagellated form to the biofilm form. This is then followed by the final stage, which is dispersal, where some of the bacteria will uh, be released and they can then cause infections in fresh sites. So this matrix in case of Suromonas is mostly composed of three different exopolysaccharides. These are PEL, PSL and alginate. And they differ in the composition uh, of the sugar that is present. And uh, this matrix, as I have said earlier, makes the bacteria resistant to antimicrobial bacteria from host immune system. So this is a major problem. And uh, initiation of biofilms, as we said, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, happens through flagella. So flagella, um, so these are some of the microscopic images showing different kinds of exopolysaccharide and uh, the biofilm matrix present in Suromonas. So flagella as we discussed is important for initial uh, biofilm formation. Not only biofilm formation, it is important for infection, pathogenesis. And again, a flagellate variants of this organism, they fail to cause infection in mouse models. Not only that, uh, when the uh, pathogen infects humans, the antibodies are produced against the flagella protein, which is the flagellin, uh, which is the major part of the filament. So this is the filament protein, fly C and antibody response happens against the flagella. So flagella is very important for this organism, for infection, for biofilm formation, for pathogenesis. So this is a typical bacterial flagella and it has three major parts. There is a basal body, which helps to anchor the flagella to the membrane. There is this hook like structure, which helps the, uh, which allows the bacteria to rotate this flagella in the 360 direction. And there is this long uh, filament which helps to propel the organism forward. So just for the synthesis of these three different parts, there are about 50 different genes that need to be overexpressed. All these genes which are uh, here shown in green boxes, they are expressed for the synthesis and assembly and function of this flagella. Now there is a, at the molecular level, all these gene expression is under the control of a single protein, which is called as a master regulator, FLEQ. So this protein is a three domain protein. It has a rec domain or a sensory domain at the end terminus. There's a triple A plus ATPase domain in the center, and there is a DNA binding domain. So this protein, if you knock out in suramanas, all flagellar genes get downregulated, which means it's an activator of flagellar gene expression. So any activator will interact with RNA polymerase and then bring about transcription activation. Interestingly, another study, uh, we, it was found that when this protein is knocked out, flagellar genes are down-regulated, but L and PSL genes become up-regulated. So which means these are the exopolysaccharides, which are important component of the biofilms, which means it's a repressor of PEL and PSL. So in planktonic lifestyle of the bacteria, when it is free floating, flagellar genes are activated by FLEQ and exopolysaccharide or the biofilm genes are repressed by FLEQ. However, another interesting study, that when this secondary messenger cyclic DIGMP molecule, concentration of cyclic DIGMP in the bacterial cell increases, this is nothing but two GTP molecules joined together uh, forms the cyclic DIGMP. And when the concentration of this molecule in the cell increases, it binds to FLEQ. And when it binds to FLEQ, it starts activating biofilm genes. So FLEQ is an interesting molecule. It acts as an activator of biofilm genes. It is a repressor, sorry, activator of flagellar genes, repressor of biofilm genes. When bound to cyclic DIGMP, it activates biofilm genes and it represses flagellar genes. It's a very, very interesting. And we were interested in understanding how all of this is brought about, how it's acting as an activator, how it acts as a repressor in the planktonic lifestyle, 
how when the organism switches to biofilm lifestyle, how it acts as an activator of biofilm genes. So that was the primary uh, um, interest in our lab in the beginning. So first we expressed purified uh, FLEQ and a very talented PhD um, student in my lab, Priyajit, crystallized this program. complex with ATP. So we use non-hydrolyzable ATP so that uh, we can capture this uh, substrate bound conformation and ATP is not hydrolyzed. Otherwise, if you use ATP as it is, you will get ADP and PI. So we, this is non-hydrolyzable analog of ATP, which mimics ATP. So we see that central domain is made up of two do subdomains. There's an alpha beta subdomain at the N terminus. There's a C terminus alpha helical subdomain. And at the interface of these two domains, there is the ATP binding site. So there are two subdomains which are joined together by loops. And at this junction is the ATP binding site. Additionally, we saw that this protein organizes as a hexamer and such that each monomer is bound to one molecule of ATP. So this is the organization in the crystals that we observed for this protein. Uh, also know, uh, looked at the details of interactions of ATP in uh, side chains and we saw that all the Walker A motif which is colored here in um, blue interact or stabilize the binding of ATP in the active site. The Walker B motif particularly the E246 is the catalytic residue so these participate in catalysis and this interacts uh, forms a hydrogen bond with the gamma phosphate of the ATP through a water molecule. Then in addition to this, there is sensor one, sensor two, which sense the presence of ATP in the active site. So these residues are also important. Next, what we did, there is a sensor one histidine. So we just mutated the single amino acid to alanine. So we did the uh, michaelis menten kinetics for ATPase activity. We see the wild type enzyme has ATPase activity. And however, if you do a single point mutation in sense of one, ATP is completely lost based on the crystal structure. Next, we also performed QRT-PCR. Uh, here, uh, we, what we have done, we have taken the, uh, uh, in delta FLQ strain of the bacteria, there is no transcription activation of flagellar gene. We are looking at flagellar gene expression over here. When you do, vec when you, uh, do a vector control, again, there is no expression of flagellar genes. However, if you complement this delta FLEQ with a wild type uh, FLEQ, you see flagellar genes expressed. However, if you complement using the alanine mutant, there is no expression. So we concluded that ATPase activity is important for flagellar gene expression in FLEQ. So then uh, there's another interesting protein called FLEN, which regulates the activity of FLEQ. So FLEQ is a transcription factor. It's an ATPase. ATPase activity is important for activating flagellar gene expression. But FLEN, which is also an ATPase, has these different motifs for ATP binding, which when knocked out, results in multi-flagellate phenotypes. This is wild type bacteria with single polar flagella. And if you knock out FLEN, you get multiple flagella which means it is regulating the number of flagella in this bacteria. So we also got interested in this protein and Chanchal, who's another graduate student in my lab, uh, showed that FLEN physically interacts with FLEQ. So FLEQ is a DNA binding protein, binds to DNA. FLEN does not bind to DNA. It does not prevent FLEQ from binding to DNA, but it binds to FLEQ physically in the presence of ATP. So this was done by biolayer interferometry experiment. We calculated the association constant between these two proteins. In addition, we showed that FLEQ has an ATPase activity. FLEN also has very low ATPase activity. However, if you mix these two protein, the ATPase activity of FLEQ is lost. So FLEN inhibits ATPase activity of FLEQ is what we conclude on this experiment. Next, Chanchal determined the crystal structure of FLEN. So this is a ATP binding protein. So we've also crystallized FLEN in complex with ATP and we solved the structure as well. And to our surprise, we bounced
It's a monomer. We wanted to understand if this, this has any biological significance or not. So we uh, made some mutations in the protein active in ATP binding, and we showed that when ATP cannot bind, protein cannot dimerize. Not only that, when um, ATP cannot bind, FLEN loses its ability to interact with FLEQ. It cannot inhibit the ATPase activity of FLEQ any longer. So dimer is the functional form of FLEN. I'm not showing the details of those experiments, but what we concluded. So this is the FLEN uh, interact, if ATP interacting with FLEN, we identified some important residues for ATP binding. And if we mutate that, FLEN cannot dimerize and FLEN was no longer able to inhibit the ATPase activity of FLEQ. This is FLEQ ATPase activity. This is FLEN wild type ATPase activity. If you add those two proteins, FLEQ loses its ATPase activity. But if you take these mutations, which were defective in ATP binding, the protein is no longer able to inhibit the ATPase activity. So we concluded FLEN is inhibitor of FLEQ. It inhibits its ATPase activity, and it does so only when it is in a dimeric form. And dimer is formed only when FLEN can bind to ATP, otherwise not. So then there was a crystal structure that was published of cyclic DIGMP with F. Remember I told you in the beginning, when FLEQ binds to secondary messenger cyclic DIGMP in the cell, it becomes an activator of biofilm genes. So the structure was published. Uh, in PNAs, and uh, we compared this structure to our structure, which was ATP bound, and we see that these two molecules bind close to each other. They don't bind to same site, but adjacent site, and some of the residues were common, uh, which were binding to cyclic DIGMP and to ATP, and therefore, when cyclic DIGMP is bound to FLEQ, ATP cannot bind. So we did this experiment in our lab, and we showed that in presence of increasing cyclic DIGMP concentration, activity of FLEQ is inhibited. If ATPase activity is going to be inhibited, flagellar genes will not be expressed. And therefore, FLEQ, when it binds to cyclic DIGMP, organism transition to biofilm lifestyle because cyclic DIGMP inhibits ATPase activity of FLEQ, and ATPase activity is important for flagellar gene expression. So flagella will shut down and biofilm genes will be expressed. Next, uh, we came back to FLE and FLEQ story, and we were interested in understanding the details of what FLEN is doing to inhibit the ATPase activity of FLEQ. How does it do it? So we made a plus which domain of FLEQ does FLEN interact with? So we engineered a series of constructs. Uh, where we took, as I mentioned earlier, there are three different domains in FLEQ. So we made REC plus central domain, central domain alone, REC domain alone, DNA binding domain alone. And we checked the ability of all these constructs to interact with FLEQ, again through BLI. And we found that any construct which does not have central domain is not capable of binding to FLEN. So uh, REC domain alone and DBD, that is the DNA binding domain, cannot show any binding. Any construct play plus ATPS domain showed double binding with FLEQ. So we concluded that central domain is necessary and sufficient for interaction with FLEN because on its own, it was also showing equally good binding compared to the wild type protein. Next, we wanted to check if central domain also shows because it's an ATPS domain, we checked its ATPS activity. And when we add FLEN, again, it FLEN inhibited the ATPase activity of central domain. So FLEN, FLEQ interaction is happening through central domain, and FLEN is able to inhibit ATPase activity of central domain. So next, uh, we being crystallographers, we crystallize this complex uh, of the protein, and we see that it forms a heterotetrameric complex, which means, again, FLEN was in the dimeric form, this is shown in yellow. This is one monomer of FLEN, second monomer of FLEN. FLEN is bound to ATP. So this uh, supports our previous hypothesis that FLEQ can interact with FLEN only when FLEN is dimer. Indeed, we had a dimer crystal structure and the dimer was formed only when ATP. 
So this is all agreeing to our earlier observation. And this dimer was interacting with two monomers of central domain of FLEQ. So this is shown in green. This is one domain, uh, sorry, one monomer, and this is the other monomer. Next, we want to compare these structures, whether there was any structural change when complex was formed. So first we compared with our earlier determined FLEN structure. So this is in uh, purple and our current complex structure, FLEN from the current complex structure is in yellow. And we see that these are practically identical. Looking very similar, except this C terminus part, which has major conformational changes. So this was disordered in other structure that we had determined earlier, but it became ordered. So there was a loop followed by two small helices in the complex structure. So FLEN uh, does not show major conformational change except in the C-terminus part ordered when it binds to FLEQ. ATP binding site of FLEN is quite conserved. There was no conformational change. And out of curiosity, we superimpose monomer of FLEN. Again, we had determined this structure in our lab onto this complex structure, and it shows clashes with FLEQ, again endorsing our previous observation that monomer of FLEN cannot interact with FLEQ. FLEN must dimerize, and that must happen in the presence of ATP. Only then it can interact with FLEQ because monomeric form shows severe clashes. So this was all good, so far so good. Next, this no major conformational change in FLEN on complex formation except the C-terminus part. Then we compare FLEQ structure in the complex structure and the earlier determined structure in our lab. And again here, the complex structure is shown in red. And uh, sorry, they are both uh, by mistake labeled as complex. Oh, this is FLEQ ATP gamma is complex, but this is FLEQ FLEN complex. So this is correct. Earlier determined structure is in red and current structure is in green. We see drastic conformational changes in this case. FLEN doesn't show conformational change, but FLEQ does. So what is really happening here is, I explained earlier that there are two subdomains in FLEQ. And at the interface of the subdomain, there is ATP binding site. So this movement is taking place. And as a result of this movement, the ATP binding site, which is at the interface becomes distorted. And this distortion prevents ATP from binding to FLEQ. So FLEN binding results, causes a distortion in FLEQ and ejection of ATP from FLEQ. So this is the comparison of these two structures. You can see the green structure sort of is like this and compared to red, which is more relaxed. Many residues have conformation changed in the active site, including the catalytic residue. So this distortion means that active site is distorted as a result of which ATP cannot bind. This is another um, view of the active site. This is in the APO structure. In the absence of ATP, this is FLEQ. The active site is very nicely formed. This is the complex structure in presence of ATP, FLEQ, active site is nicely formed. However, in our complex structure with FLEN, you can see there's distortion. And if you try to fit in ATP here, there is clash. So ATP cannot bind to this structure at all. Uh, there's another interesting observation in the structure we made, which is called as a conformational relay on nucleotide binding. So in, this is FLEQ again, and this is the ATP that is bound. Now we saw that when ATP is not bound in the complex structure, the glutamic acid conformation is changed to 180 degrees. So there's a glue switch is shutting down. This is off conformation, this is on conformation. On conformation will form interactions with ATP. When ATP is not there, this will flip 180 degrees and will be in the off conformation. And this will be off conformation is stabilized by another residue, which is called asparagine. So this off conformation, these two residues are interacting. Glue, uh, asparagine are interacting with each other when it is shut down. See that the terminus part of FLAN, which had undergone a conformational change, is interacting with this asparagine, hitting it so that it turn it into an off conformation. 
So FLEN is not only preventing ATP from binding to FLEQ, it is ensuring that hydrolysis shuts down by ensuring that glue switch and asparagine switch are in off conformation. So FLEN hits this uh, asparagine, it flips 180 degree, glue switch flips from that side, these two interact with each other. And this is the part which became of FLEN in yellow, which became structured in the complex, which is showing a lot of interactions with residues of FLEQ. Next, we wanted to validate all this structure data in vivo, in uh, vitro as well as in vivo. So this is the part of the FLEN which became structured upon binding to FLEQ. So this is shown here in red helix, these two helix. So we deleted this entire stretch. In addition to this, we also made a single point mutation, which is uh, uh, this leucine 263, we made it into a bulky tryptophan, which is also on the interface. So if we introduce some big bulky residue at the interface, these two proteins should not interact. If we delete this part, which is forming major interactions, there should be no interactions. We performed BLI experiment, but before we did that, we wanted to make sure we haven't disturbed the dimer. Dimer has to form, right? Otherwise, it won't interact. So we checked for dimerization. Both these uh, constructs showed dimer formation. Not only that, both these constructs showed ATPA's activity was intact. So there was no disturbing the structure by making these mutations. So which is that we see in crystal structure is indeed in vitro, because if you disturb that interface, there is no interaction between the two proteins. Also, these uh, mutants are defective in reducing the activity of FLEQ. If there's no interaction, they can't inhibit the activity of FLEQ. Then we made a small peptide, only of this much length. And we see that peptide is capable of inhibiting ATPase activity of FLEQ. Protein is not there, but just this peptide to some extent is able to inhibit the activity. So therefore, interface that we saw in crystal structure is validated in vitro. Next, we want to validate the same interface in vivo. We perform motility assays. This is in soft agar plate. This is the motility zone. We are measuring the diameter of the zone and plotting it here. This is wild type bacteria. This is delta FLEN. If there's no FLEN, uh, there is no motility. Then we uh, complement it. I think these two are ulta. So this is a vector control. And this is when you complement, the motility is restored. And when you complement with either the truncated protein or just a single amino acid chain of leucine to tryptophan, motility is not restored. So therefore, these are defective even in vivo. We also looked at the flagellar phenotypes and uh, we see that wild type bacteria has single polar flagella, delta FLEN has multi-flagellate phenotype, vector control also is multi-flagellate phenotype. If you complement with wild type FLEN, single polar flagella is restored, but if you complement with any of these mutants, you still see multi-flagellate phenotype, which means they are not interacting with FLEQ, they cannot uh, regulate its ATPs activity and you see all kinds of flagellar formation. So we validated this result in both in vitro as well as. Then we were curious to see if this mechanism is only true for pseudomonas or it will happen in all monoflagellate bacteria. So we took FLEQ sequences from all the monoflagellate bacteria and FLEN and we aligned them and we see at all these interface residues were quite conserved in other monoflagellated bacteria. So this may be a common way to regulate flagellous formation in all the monoflagellate bacteria. Now we compared the cyclic DIGMP bound bound structure, which these two are molecules are the two regulators of FLEQ activity. When a cyclic DIGMP binds, FLEQ loses its ATPase activity. When FLEN binds, it again loses its ATPase. And to our surprise, both these structures were very close in conformation to each other. So in both, them, both of them, there is conformational change that is taking place the same. When cyclic DIGMP binds or FLEN binds, ATP cannot bind. 
and both these structures are very similar to each other. So we propose the system that FLAQ, which forms a hexamer, and this hexamer is important for uh, transcription activation. This is DNA, this is RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase interacts, uh, FLAQ interacts with RNA polymerase through these loops, which are uh, present in the center of the pore when hexamer is formed. And this interaction is necessary for transcription activation. When FLAN binds to FLAQ, ATP is ejected out and these loop conformation is changing as a result of which it won't be able to interact with RNA polymerase and transcription will shut down. When FLAQ will now bind to cyclic DIGMP, this will again result in ejection of ATP, flagellar genes will shut down and this will then activate the biofilm related gene and bacteria will transition from flagellated to the biofilm form. So this is what uh, is the result, the story that I wanted to present, which we published in Science Advances. Uh, this is to show you that flagellar genes are not regulated only by FLEQ. There are many, many players and uh, flagellar genes are expressed in sort of cascade. So first the genes responsible for synthesis of basal body are expressed, then the hook is formed and then the filament finally. And these, uh, depending upon the genes and the time of expression, they've been classified as class one, class two, class three genes. Apart from FLAQ sits at the top of this hierarchy, regulates all these genes, but this is not the only regulator. There is FLEN, which regulates activity of FLAQ. So we have seen this, how it is done in detail. There are other regulators such as FLHF, which is responsible for polar placement of flagella. There is FLE. SR, this is a kinase, this is a transcription factor, which then activates the expression of class three genes. There is sigma 28, which is present in complex with its inhibitor fly M. And this complex breaks to make fly uh, A, which is also sigma 28, free of its inhibitor. This then associates with RNA polymerase and transcription of late flagellar genes takes place. So in our lab, we are looking at all these structures of all these regulators. And I want to acknowledge the efforts of all my students who are involved in this uh, endeavor. So Priyajit worked on FLEQ, Chanchal did FLEN and the complex structure. Shika has determined the structure of GTPAs, which is responsible for polar placement of flagella. Pankaj has uh, structurally characterized this transcription factor, which is important for class three gene expression. Shinu is looking at fly A, fly M complex, uh, how this is inhibited. And in collaboration with Vineet, who has now purified the entire and reconstituted this RNA polymerase from pseudomonas, they are looking at how this uh, fly A will interact with polymerase for transcription activation. In addition, we are also doing biofilm regulation in pseudomonas. So Momita is looking at how PEL and PSL expression is regulated in pseudomonas. And Anirban, who is an integrated PhD student, is looking at how alginate expression is regulated in pseudomonas for biofilm formation. Apart from that, we have in the we have also we are also working on two component system which is involved in antimicrobial resistance in Staphylococcus aureus. We determined its structure in the past, and Ritu, who is a postdoc, is has done some experiments to validate these structural data. We have also in the past done RNA polymerase, which is a single subunit RNA polymerase from mitochondria. This work has now been published. I also want to acknowledge all my collaborators uh, and who's in association with them. We have done a lot of structural studies. For example, Professor Shubrit Sina from Ames. We modeled PCDH and published this study in eBiomedicine. Uh, in collaboration with Dr. Divya Chandran, we have modeled some of the fungal effector proteins and also now structurally characterized an antifungal protein from Burkold area. And this uh, uh, project is in collaboration with Gopal Jija. We are working on some quorum sensing regulators in collaboration with Professor Sunil Khare from IIT Delhi. We have also determined structure of another plant protein in collaboration with uh, Dr. Niranjan from NIPGR. 
In addition to that, I want to acknowledge all the funding um, and the beam lines that we access, without which structural studies are not possible. X-ray diffraction facility at RCB, DBT, ESRF partnership, because of which we have been able to access all kinds of beam lines at ESRF. Um, I have a bunch of trainees in the lab who are helping the students and postdocs in the lab. And funding is from these DST, DBT, RCB core funding. And more recently, we have received an Indo-Belgian grant on antimicrobial resistance and biofilm formation in pseudomonas. Uh, with that, I'll end my presentation, and I'll be happy to take questions. Yes. And you said that you break the FLE in Gardner, it cannot in this. Yes. Yes. So it's not complete because affiliate itself also has an ATPase activity. So what we are measuring is now an affiliate ATPase activity. So it comes down to the level of affiliate. So affiliate is a weak ATPase. FLEQ activity is here, affiliate activity is here. When you add affiliate and FLEQ, it comes down to the level of affiliate. It doesn't go beyond that because we are not disturbing affiliate uh, ATPase activity. Okay. Uh, let me just go back quickly. This one, right? Yeah. Yeah. They don't go all the way up to one. Yeah, uh, well, we do not know if just single point mutation is weakening this ability to bind or it's completely abrogating. We don't, uh, so the way we measure the diameter formation is through DLS. And we see that DLS uh, shows a smaller monom, I mean, in the sense in, it shows a monomer, presence of a monomer, but there could be some population uh, which may still dimerize. I mean, that is one possibility. Uh, because I don't know if single point mutation is completely 100% inhibiting its ability. On the other hand, we made this catalytic mutant, so which can bind efficiently to FLE, uh, sorry, with uh, ATP, but it cannot hydrolyze. So it gets locked into a dimer, and you see that inhibition is so, so great. So, yeah. So maybe it's partial loss of. Uh, Shilpi. So uh, it does not regulate synthesis at all. It's a sensor for cyclic DIGMP. There are a different set of enzymes in uh, pseudomonas called diguanylate cyclases, which synthesize cyclic DIGMP from GTP. So those enzymes get upregulated whenever there is a signal from the environment to switch to the biofilm mode of life. As a result, cyclic DIGMP concentration increases and that then is sensed by FLEQ. Um, Prem, you had a question. Yes. So we have measured affinities. We have measured affinities. Huh. I think concentration of these nucleotides is sufficiently high in the cell, which can bind to both of them. And uh, we have measured affinities. Uh, the 
FLE and affinity to ATP is a lot higher compared to FLEQ. So if there's a preferential binding, we do not know. Although I feel that it will bind to both of them because it's not limiting in the cell, the ATP concentration. But yes, uh, FLEN binds more strongly to ATP compared to FLEQ. So FLEN, we think, so FLEQ, if, if you, right, which means FLEQ unregulated and a lot of flagellar gene synthesis is taking place. But when FLEN is there, it is not completely inhibiting. It's just dialing down the ATPase activity of FLEQ to an extent that only single polar flagella is formed. If it will completely shut down, then there'll be no flagella at all. So both these proteins are present simultaneously in the cell, but FLEQ is a regulate transcription activator of FLEN synthesis. So if there is each other and post-transcriptionally FLEN is regulating the activity of FLEQ. So it's just dialing down activity and ensuring that only that much ATPase activity is uh, expressed by FLEQ so that single polar flagella is synthesized. We have made a mutation in FLEQ where ATPase activity enhances drastically. And we see that it is multiple flagella even in the presence of FLEN. Anti-activator, uh, I... Uh, the definition that we have come up with, repressor will interact with DNA and it will prevent RNA polymerase from binding. Whereas anti-activator can interact with activator, regulate its activity or with, uh, so that's, that is what uh, the definition that we have come up with. Yes, yes. So there are differences in cascade, the regulators, their mode of um, dimerization, some in E. coli, it's peritricus. That uh, master regulator forms heterotetramer. So it's very different uh, regulation altogether in peritricus versus monotricus. Yeah, so now what uh, Momita is also pursuing this antibiofilm activity of uh, some compounds. So we think that FLEQ is a good target because it activates biofilm gene expression. Plus it uh, also regulates other uh, biofilm related genes um, such as those important for adhesion. Um, so there are a bunch of other promoters at which FLEQ can act as an activator of biofilm related genes. So we think it's a very good target. We are currently doing in silico drug discovery to find inhibitors of cyclic DIGMP binding to FLEQ so that it cannot transition into an activator of biofilms. And we are testing these molecules in vitro for antibiofilm activity in the lab. And uh, we'll also see if in vivo it is functional or not. Yes, polytrichus phenotype is defective in? Virulence, I don't know, but we have checked biofilm formation in the lab. Um, that, that is also defective in biofilm formation. So it is multiple flagella, but they're not functional. So motility is also defective and ability to form biofilm is also defective. Yes. Yes. So ATP is high, uh, it will be an ATPase. And uh, cyclic DIGMP has to cross, cross a certain threshold, the concentration. Because uh, if you measure cyclic DIGMP, even in flagellated form, there will be some amount of cyclic, but it has to cross a certain threshold when concentration increases beyond that, only then it will uh, compete 
the ATP out. So, ATP. Uh, no, because it will result in flagella formation. Flagellated uh, form of the bacteria is infectious. It wild type is infectious. It is virulent. Only uh, when flagellar genes are down-regulated, at the same time it is encapsulated in this polysaccharide matrix, it becomes resistant to antibiotics because of the matrix, the physical barrier that it is. So ability to cause infection is in, flagella is important. You you had a question. Yeah, we thought that we thought that, but its ability to form biofilms is defective. So it's not just the presence of flagella. There's a lot of other things happening, like chemotaxis, like so. It is we think flagella burnt rare, but it's not really functional. So it was also defective. Uh, so physical presence of flagella is one thing, but actual function where it can make this rotation, rotatory movement, sense. Those things will not happen. Maybe some other defects are there. Yes, they were all multiple polar. So now we have other polarity regulator protein, which if it is mutated and we start seeing lateral or a flagellate variant. So we are uh, trying to understand how polarity is maintained. But on uh, FLEN knockout, it's all polar, but multiple. Because polarity is determined by another protein. FLHF. So, I, as long as that is intact, it will be polar. It could, we have not uh, done so much in detail, but we have checked motility of that. Uh, bacteria where we have increased ATPase activity and it is polyflagellate. Motility is defective and uh, so is biofilm formation. So we concluded that flagella physically is present, but it's not functional. But whether we have also made some movies of bacteria moving and they don't seem to move, they seem to go in circles round round, not in the forward direction. So, but what exactly is happening molecular level, we don't know. So we feel that it's flagellated but defective uh, it's not a proper functional flagella flagella otherwise rotates and uh, that propels the organism uh, it may be so motor rotation in flagella is brought about by proton gradient across the membrane i don't know exactly what's getting disturbed or what's not possible if you have multiple flagella Huh. Uh, it's not an ATPase. Uh, there are other uh, flagella which functions because of ATPase activity. This is purely a proton gradient there. So across the membrane, which uh, is responsible for creating this flagella. Uh, ATPase is not there in, in that uh, entire machinery. Yeah. Although there are bacteria which have multiple polar flagella coming out from the same pole, so they are called lophotrichus. So, but they all move together. They rotate together. The whole bunch rotates together to help. That may synchronization may be lost. They are all at one point. So, uh, the mutant we showed are all at one pole. Flagella are all at one pole. Uh, because FLHF is still there and that is what regulates polarity. So it is all at one pole, but they're not moving in synchrony. You know, the, when in Lophotychus bacteria, where you have multiple flagella from the same pole, they all move like a bunch. You know, the whole thing moves like a 
bunch. That synchronization is not happening, although we see multiple flagella here. Uh, I, I would guess, but I'm not 100% sure. Yes, they will. Any other question? Hi, she has. Hi. Thanks. Uh, I think it's an equilibrium in the cell between monomer and dimer. See, when we purify, it's a monomer, but this is in vitro because there's no ATP, so it's mo it eludes as a monomer. But if you ask me in the cell, I would say it is a dynamic equilibrium. A ATP binding will dimerize it. Once ATP hydrolysis happens, it will break into monomer. And then it, again, it will bind to fresh ATP and dimer. Yes. So we are thinking that it's in equilibrium and this dimeric form. allow transcription to happen. Then again, another set of dimer will come. So it's regulating its activity. It's not inhibiting completely, but it's dialing down the activity to an extent that utna hi expression hoga that one single polar flagella is formed. If we delete FLEN, then uh, uncontrolled ATP is activity and uncontrolled flagella gene expression and uh, mono, I mean, multiple flagella is formed. So it's, it's, and it's important uh, that these interactions are not permanent because otherwise it, it, activities are inhibited. So it's an equilibrium. Yes, yes. Then it uh, hydrolyzes ATP, it breaks into monomer, FLEQ can, Activate transcription. So FLEN has lot lower ATP's activity. Its walker motif is not perfect. It's called a deviant walker. Uh, whether that's again, we want we were interested in looking at why uh, ATP's activity in FLEN is so low. So we found some residues which potentially are important for less activity, but we need to validate them by mutagenesis and other things. But uh, yes, 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 yes. So you want dimer to be for substantial time. If the hydrolysis rate was very fast, then this monomer dimer is happening very quickly. And that's not enough time for regulating the ATPase activity. So by design, FLEN has slow ATPase activity, but FLEQ has fast ATPase activity. FLEN. Uh, so they have made overexpression of, of FLEN, not having literature. Uh, the chemotaxis defect is what they say, motility defect, chemotaxis defect, but uh, exactly what is happening again, that's just an observation. Yes. Yes. Uh, I need to uh, check me whether it is a flagellate, it should be a flagellate phenotype, right? Uh, but I need to check, I don't remember it right now. Thank you.